My name is Daisha Clay. I'm the audio librarian here at Classical 91.7. While I'm a real librarian, I have a deep, dark secret. I know very little about classical music. I grew up listening to rock. And I know something about jazz. But when it comes to classical... But I really want to learn. So... Every week on this show, a classical music expert will give me a piece of classical music they think I should know, and then we'll discuss it. Come learn with me in the classical classroom. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the classical classroom. I'm Daisha Clay, and here with me all the way from WETA are Christopher O'Reilly and Matt Heimovitz. You might recognize Christopher O'Reilly from the NPR show, from the top of which he's been the host for about 15 years. He's a pianist. He attended the New England Conservatory of Music. And like Classical Classroom, Christopher is all about bringing classical music to new audiences. In fact, in addition to his uh, more traditional classical music recordings, he's made some very cool collections of songs by Radiohead, Nick Drake, Nirvana, and others that are arranged for piano. Matt Heimovitz is a cellist. He attended Juilliard and Harvard. Never heard of either of those schools. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) He was the youngest person to receive the Avery Fisher Career Grant for Exceptional Musical Achievement. He likes to bring classical music to uh, non-traditional venues like nightclubs. In fact, he was the first classical artist to record at CBGB's, the famous New York club. Um, He started the Oxingale record label on which you can find Chris and Matt's brand new CD called Beethoven Period. Guys, welcome to the show. Thank you, Daisha. Thanks. Great to be here. So what are you going to be teaching me about today? Well, playing the Beethoven sonatas on uh, original instruments. And sorry, this is Chris, right? I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> I can't see yes. either of you, so <laughs> just making sure. We've we've been playing together now for four or five years, and we're always slaves to our passions and discoveries. So um, w- we were invited to play at the Beethoven International Festival in Chicago, um, and the thought was... If they had an instrument available, we wanted to maybe perform them on the instruments of Beethoven's time. Mm-hmm. Uh, oftentimes, and and Matt can speak to this directly, but he he will absolutely admit to really hating playing with piano, more or less. I think it's a terrible combination. Yeah, cello and piano, <laughs> they just they don't belong in the same room, as yeah. far as I'm concerned. Yeah, and and sometimes, I mean, he's he's been pitted against you know, muscular Russian pianists. I mean, I had to beg him to play the Rachmaninoff Sonata with me because the last time he played it, you know, he was playing with a pianist, you know, with whom he could not be heard. No names will be mentioned. No names, but uh, (laughs) muscular Russian, I think. We'll we'll just pass with that. Muscular Russian. Yeah, so so the idea behind... It wasn't Putin. No, it wasn't. (laughs) Um, we, We got to play on a forte piano. We call our modern instrument a piano forte, and that's best basically how it was. But the forte piano was, an er- was the early version of the piano, and there were instruments in Beethoven's time, in Mozart's time, that the hammer strikes the strings as opposed to a harpsichord where the strings are basically plucked by the keyboard. Mm-hmm. Um, the forte piano is not as loud as the contemporary piano. And so in playing with the forte piano, I was the one who had to be worried about being drowned out. Matt had suddenly all kinds of room to not only be heard, but to be expressive and Mm -hmm. to really be weaving in and out of the texture in terms of prominence or or retiring. That's the point that changes everything, really, is when I when I have to put things in relief so that you can hear things happening in the piano part, 
that's a that's an experience that I I just simply didn't have before working with the Forte piano. Um, I liken it to the scene uh, in Titanic when Leonardo DiCaprio is handcuffed by the evil uh, ship's uh, steward, um, and the water is rising, and he <laughs> barely has enough room to breathe, and and that's oftentimes I think where this dastardly uh, partnership between piano and cello uh, falls flat because yeah. he usually barely has enough room, headroom, to really just be heard. Mm-hmm. So huh. Matt, uh, Matt had found uh, a, a cello of Beethoven's time uh, on which he could uh, replace the steel strings with gut strings. Well, Matt, mm-hmm. you, you take over. You can tell her all about this. Right, so I, yeah, I, I got a hold of this cello actually at an auction uh, and just made a very impulse <laughs> purchase. It looked it looked great. I didn't even have a chance to, to try it. But I, I outfitted it with, with the gut strings, with these ox gut strings from, from Italy. Well, let's get really basic and explain exactly what gut strings are. Because oh, strings. we're talking, and first, and actually before we even go there, what period is this from? Like when... Did the forte piano exist? When d- d- when were people playing on gut strings? We're, we're talking about, uh, for our sake, uh, late uh, 18th century and beginning of early early 19th century. Okay. And okay. it was incredible how fast the technology was developing then. So within the span of one or two decades, the forte piano slash piano was evolving at a very rapid pace. Pace. It was getting louder and louder very quickly, mm-hmm. and um, you know, loudness isn't everything. I mean, it's just the, to some degree we lost. There, there's a sense of humanity to these instruments, like the the. Yeah. I mean, I with with in Chris's case when he was playing the Broadwood forte piano, that he had a soft pedal. He had he had a unicorda pedal that mm-hmm. was so magical and i was incredibly jealous of this effect i, I wanted to take out all, all my guitar pedals and you know have something to compete with that kind of color it was just just incredible uh, what what yeah. what he was achieving with that and that also was a revelation for the beethoven sonatas because all of a sudden when you have something incredibly quiet you have pianissimo marked and and beethoven was mm-hmm. a man of extremes he wrote extreme dynamic markings Telling us to play soft and softer and softer, you know, and and I mean, he just kept he kept pushing it, and yeah. and then you understand when you have an instrument like that that can achieve that. Well, what he was ba- after, basically, to to give you the background. I mean, when you look at the inside of a piano, a modern piano, most of the keys have three strings for each note that you play on the piano. Mm-hmm. And so, when Matt refers to the una corda pedal, that means one chord, one string. And mm-hmm. even on a modern piano, the sort of the soft pedal, the left put, left pedal on the piano, the, the break, as it were, uh, shifts the whole keyboard over so that the hammer is no longer striking three strings, but it's actually striking two. So you get a little bit more of a uh, a plangent sound, and it certainly is less loud, to say the least. On the mm-hmm. Broadwood, the 1823 original Broadwood that we recorded and performed on, this instrument has the capability of actually shifting the keyboard over so that you really are playing on one string per note. And it gives it this sort of guitar-like quality. Very uh, delicate. Very delicate. And so it's a very different color. Okay, well, that that kind of answered a big question that I have because, you know, often when I hear uh, music that's played on on period instruments, I'm always like, there's this part of me that's kind of going, eh, what are you doing? Yeah. We've, we've got <laughs> we've got plenty of great modern instruments to play. Right. I feel like I I sometimes feel like these recordings are kind of like the classical music equivalent of, you know, like an indie band recording on a four track despite the existence of <laughs> lo-fi. <laughs> yeah. Well, and Pro Tools, it's lo-fi. Yeah. And, but yet, yeah. and yet, you know, people are putting out vinyl now more than, <laughs> you know, more than CDs. Yeah. So, right. so there, there's a certain nostalgia for it. But also, I mean, it, in, in a way, I think of these early instruments 
I mean, that was the technological equivalent of the iPhone and the iPad and the, you know, I mean, the, these these were some these were the cutting edge technologies, and it's it's amazing to me that over hundreds of years the cello hasn't changed that much. Well, I was just gonna say, like in this situation, it seems like like these particular period instruments really make sense for this combination of of instruments. I mean, like clearly Beethoven's markings and just the the sheer volume of the piano in this combination, like it just makes sense. Well, we're also dealing with, uh, in Beethoven's time, you were playing in smaller rooms. Mm -hmm. It was, in fact, a more intimate sound. There wasn't necessarily the desire or need to project to the back of a 2,000-seat hall. Right. Um, and in a, in a modern situation, you're still dealing with a very intimate, uh, in the case of this recording, you're dealing with an intimate listening situation. Mm -hmm. the microphones are very close to these instruments. And so there's no need again to you know swing for the back rows of the hall. Uh, you're, what you're what you're getting is an immediacy and an intimacy of sound, and a much more palpable sense of of the great range of color, which is you know not necessarily all about projecting you know mm -hmm. the sound. It's all about making a, a malleable and infinitely colorful sound mm -hmm. to the point where you know I, I think a general general rule of thumb as far as modern pianos and forte pianos are concerned we're, we we really love we relish we, we revel in the booming sound of the Steinway bass register yeah and and the beautiful ever singing sound of, of the upper register that just rings forever. Uh, on the forte piano, the bass is not so much booming as more penetrative. It's almost like a bassoon type sound. Hmm. So again, you're, you're you're not making a you're not making a welling up kind of sound that's going to bury the sound of the cello. You're really just making a, a more punchy and a much more transparent and penetrating sound. Mm -hmm. And and the right hand, the upper register of the piano, is again still very singing by comparison to the bass. But again, in a in a much more fragile sort of way. What happens is is the sense of rhetoric, the sense of speech that you get in the phrase, uh, becomes much more defined and much more natural for us to to produce. We of course we can learn from this and adapt it to whatever tools we have to the modern modern setup. But with the uh, with the original instruments, that's organic to the language. Yeah. Now the gut strings. I feel like we got sidetracked a little bit. Um, were these actually made of guts originally? And, and what are they made of? What are they made of now? You're about to lose your uh, animal rights audience. I'm, <laughs> I'm really sorry. I'm going well, to tell least... you about the slaughterhouse. This is where it begins. Yeah. Yeah. Um, actually, since I've become really interested in... These in are free-range gut strings, though. So tell her, the, tell her about that. <laughs> good, so good. good. Yeah, yeah. They're and they come with a dozen sourced. eggs with every okay. purchase, cool. actually. Yeah. Um, yeah, these... It's not cat gut. I'll tell yeah, you that because that would never or, have washed dog, with me. Yeah, um, no. <laughs> now you you can get a range of gut strings. Uh, now the reason I use these strings from the Taro brothers in Italy, well, I love the sound of them, and they apparently live right next to a slaughterhouse, and so the 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 gut you can get ox gut, you can get ram gut, all kinds of different different gut. I happen to like the ox gut for my cello. And uh, so the string goes straight from the, from the slaughterhouse to, to the workshop mm -hmm. of, of these brothers who his, their family has been making these strings for hundreds of years. And so it's the same process that they've always used. Yeah. And I'm imagining them with uh, a nice bottle of Chianti or two. And, and uh, the strings are not always perfect, but uh, they sound great. And <laughs> it's, it's because there are no preservatives used you know it's, it's just really? it's, a, it's a very quick process straight from the slaughterhouse to their to their workshop so, so this is so, literally uh, what you're playing on is like i mean this I, is what i'm playing on and i you know i've had to change all my fingerings uh the pure gut string just feels great under the finger hmm. so i want to spend more time on it which means that i want to do more on one string instead of crossing over which you know you're you often want to do for safety or you know you, you know you want to avoid sh shifting as much as possible yeah in this case with the gut strings it's so wonderful to shift and you can get such a variety so you really can emulate the human voice you can really do all kinds of portamenti and literally there's so much more color 
portamenti. Can you define that for me? <laughs> it's basically sliding around. Oh, gotcha. Sliding okay. from sliding. One note to another. Yeah, it's, it's it's sliding around from one note to another. Okay. With, when you when you do that with a human voice, Blah. it's natural. You, yeah. As opposed to Dottie. Yeah. yeah. So that kind of sounded like Frank Sinatra. <laughs> oh, thank you, Matt. Sing wow. for thank us you more. So much. <laughs> 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 so, so how how and do the I mean do these just you know eventually because there are no preservatives, do they just sort of degrade underneath here? You know, no, do they, you no, have no to there, there must them? be some sort of preservative process in making the strings, right? I, I, I don't know the the whole process of how I haven't I've I've wanted to go visit them, wow. not to see the animals slaughtered or anything, but but right. just to 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 see how they make how they make the strings. And I, I don't really know the process. What I can tell you in the lower strings, uh, the gut. I use gut that's um, wound with silver, uh-huh. and that does come unwound. In fact, as we were, Chris and I were touring in the Northwest through Seattle, mm-hmm. Portland, Oregon, Eugene, Oregon, it started to unravel to the point where um, I just started posting pictures of of this gruesome scene of the string. <laughs> Desi- the desiccation Facebook. of the string. It was just yeah. No. It was I, I wasn't I wasn't quite sure, and I, I was I thought well this is going to get bloody because you know it's like. <laughs> It's, it's it's getting unsafe, but fortunately my calluses have been built up to the point where it's, it was all right. Was Beethoven the kind of guy who would care whether or not his music was recorded on these specific instruments that he had written for, or would he would he not have cared? Well, my teacher Russell Sherman always described Beethoven as a composer who is always asking for 20% more uh, from the performer, twenty uh, percent more than can be achieved, mm-hmm. um, and this has to do with any you know modern or original instruments sort of setup. In other words, he's asking for twenty percent more technique than anyone can possibly provide. Mm-hmm. He's asking for twenty percent more sound than can be provided. I think this had a great deal to do with you know the fact that he was hearing you know less and less as he became older and lost his hearing but he was during his lifetime very much dissatisfied with the with the stability of the instruments he was constantly breaking piano strings when he was performing and was always looking for more sound regardless you know his 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 hearing loss aside mm-hmm. so i think he would have been very pleased with this particular instrument that we played on because it had it has it has, a, it has a fair amount of sound to it, mm-hmm. um, and I think he probably would have enjoyed aspects of the modern cello and piano setup for the sheer volume of sound. But I'm pretty sure he would have rankled at the lack of revolutionary and visceral quality to the sound that I think mm-hmm. is only available on the original instruments. You know, with with the uh the Opus 69 Sonata, the, the sort of the central sonata of the five of Beethoven, mm-hmm. he really, um, he's tortured about how to create a sense of equality and balance between these two very disparate instruments. Mm-hmm. And you can see it in his handwriting. You can look at the manuscript, a beautiful manuscript has survived with Beethoven's own hand, where as the piece progresses he starts pressing more and more on the on on the sheet of paper and he starts crossing things out and he starts shifting things from the left hand of the piano to the cello and back from the cello to the right hand and he's he's really tortured about how to make this combination work hmm. and um because after all you know opus five the the two opus five sonatas were really cello sonata 1.0 these were the first pieces ever written that, you know, the cello and piano were supposedly on an even playing field. Yeah, I was going to ask. Uh, was this Mozart, like a, a common Mozart combination? Didn't do it. No, Mozart didn't do it. Haydn didn't do it. Baccarini, you know, made cello uh, show pieces, but those were basically for uh, keyboard accompaniment. 
uh, the keyboard was in the background. Uh, no, so yeah, Beethoven was really yeah, there the, was nothing, nothing the trailblazer. Like, nothing like Beethoven. Mm-hmm. And he, he, and in that sense, he was an opportunist. He saw his opening. You know, was this sort of like he was he was challenging himself? I mean, I know that the, the way you guys are describing it, the 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 forte piano and and the and the cello with the gut strings were more. They're more complementary instruments than our, the modern versions of them. But because this wasn't done, like I wonder if he, if he was setting up a challenge for himself to like work within these sort of well, difficult Well, I think he parameters. was challenged and, and inspired. There were there were actual was a, cellists of the time. Who well, were, and, and he was he was a young man with a dream, you know. I mean, he, he, it, had, it hadn't been done, so he 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 was making his way. Nobody knew who he was. Yeah. And he he in fact that was his first big trip outside of Vienna. He had just moved to Vienna and, and uh, started, you know, traveling around. Go, went to Prague and then ended up in Berlin at the at the court with King King of Prussia, who happened to be an amateur cellist. Mm-hmm. And the King of Prussia surrounded himself with the greatest cellists of the day. Chris mentioned Baccarini. Then there was uh, the the Dupour brothers, Jean, and especially Jean Louis Dupour, who was must have been a spectacular cellist. And Beethoven was very inspired. And and so the two of them, for the two of them, he he wrote the early two sonatas and two sets of variations for them to to play for the king and that's mm. how that's how it all that's how it all started so wow. fortunately there was sort of cello in the air in berlin in 1796 and that's that's what led to it but then i think beethoven really became fascinated with this combination over the course of his career and he returned to it in two further just very uh, important periods in his life one you know the opus 69 where he took a break from the fifth symphony you know so mm-hmm. imagine that beethoven's writing his the his opus big opus right the right. fifth symphony and just takes a little break as he's writing that to to just you know jot down a little opus 69 uh, sonata for cello and piano <laughs> And uh, a little me he was time. Yeah. Procrastinating. Which, which, has, which has not been surpassed in history, basically. Wow. You know? I mean, it's just the, the great, you know, cello sonata. And then later in his life, he started to have personal issues and, and uh, creative issues. He, 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 this is after the Immortal Beloved letter, mm-hmm. which some folks might have heard of. And, and so yeah. he sort of has given up on the hope that he's going to find his soulmate and, and that he will ever. Um, or any personal fulfillment as opposed to yeah, artistic fulfillment. Exactly. Yeah. And and, uh, and, they, and he's, he's writing some things f- just, you know, for some cash and nothing, some things that aren't s- such great quality. And he's he's revising a lot and he's working a lot on his opera, Fidelio. And then uh, and looking back at the music of J.S. Bach and Handel, two of his favorite composers, mm-hmm. and inspired by that sense of uh, counterpoint and, and um, you know, some of the fugal writing there, he... Uh, he emerges with the late two sonatas for cello and piano. And that's sort of the window into his late style, into mm. the very personal style, which for years uh, and still to this day, many, many audiences, you know, it's kind of out of reach. It's unintelligible to them because he's, he's gone so far from the sort of what we expect of the Enlightenment. It sounds like maybe like a problem, like a puzzle that he sort of kept coming back to. Like Over the glass time. bead game of Hermann Hesse. You know, yeah. Like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Well, it's very interesting. I mean, I feel like we've talked more about what it's like for musicians to play on these instruments, which is a huge, you know, a huge part of this. But what? how is this experience different for listeners when they're hearing ah. these pieces, uh, you know, uh, on modern instruments as, a, as opposed to period instruments? Well, it's it's really again a matter of drawing the listener in to the situation yeah. uh, instead of playing at them. So, for instance, we reunited with the uh, instrument we recorded on. We just played at the San Francisco Conservatory on this same 1823 Broadwood on which we recorded at Skywalker Ranch. I mean, what a wonderful <laughs> wow. an- anachronistic nice. juxtaposition there. <laughs> you know, you're, you're a quarter mile down the hill from the, the house that houses the first lightsabers, wow. and here you are playing on a 200-year-old instrument. Um, but another great anachronism was uh, we actually had a fortepiano copy uh, brought to the Tractor Tavern, a club that Matt had played at a number of years uh, ago uh, in Seattle. And we had a Cracker Jack sound guy, and so 
despite the you know the the small size of that piano we were able to get the sound into all the nooks and crannies and had Matt amplified as well because you know clubs you know you really need some help to get all the sound to really fill the room it doesn't have to be enormously loud but you have to have some well-placed speakers and so we were able to get the best of both worlds we could both be heard but we could draw the audience into the intimate sound of this and the audience I've never heard a more rapt really? silence from an audience as I did in that 250 seat club uh, it was just amazing and and so you know the except or- for that heckler uh, yeah. <laughs> no way <laughs> Matt well because we, well, because for the San Francisco program we were going to do the the early two sonatas and the late two sonatas because I, I agree with Matt the opus 69 is is a perfect culmination of his strivings for making an even sound between the piano and the cello such that it actually sounds pretty good on modern instruments and and uh-huh. doesn't sound quite as radical as the massive qualities of the opus 5s and the pristine counterpoint and interplay of voices, the the transparency of the Opus 102 sonatas. Mm -hmm. So we were going to leave that off the program as we did in San Francisco. And Matt says, you know what? I know this audience. They're going to demand the Opus 69 (laughs) because we're we're already dealing with a two hour program. And and sure enough, Matt is, you know, talking about, well, we're going to do the Opus 5s. And then after mission intermission, we're going to do the Opus 102s. We're going to we're going to skip Opus 69. I want my Opus I'm not leaving without Opus 69! 69! Sure enough, we had to play the 69 for our 25-minute encore at this date. Holy it, was, crap. it was quite gratifying. It was play kind of exhausting. Free Bird, man! Yeah, exactly! It was, it was Beethoven's version of Free Bird, yeah. That's awesome. I was going to I was kind of thinking about this too. You know, you you're talking about playing playing this music in a club, so it kind of answers the question that I had, but I know you guys are both you know, interested in bringing classical music to new audiences and 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 Christopher, you've you know, you've arranged Radiohead and Arcade Fire and all of that like kind of crossing those those lines in a in a really cool way and and Matt, you've played at CBGBs, which is man, that's really cool. And mm-hmm. <laughs> like, yeah. I was I was really interested that that you guys were going back to period instruments and wondering about that sort of juxtaposition of of kind of kind of looking so forward, and now you're kind of looking so so backward, not backwards, that you know, but what to a, a nerdy different thing period. To do, right? I know <laughs> <laughs> two nerds in a club. Like, <laughs> how, yeah, how those two in things a, kind a of way, come together. We, we got together a few years back, and in deference to our very uh, wide-ranging musical tastes, uh, did a t- double CD set called Shuffle, Play, Listen, uh, which uh, one disc of which was mostly classical or contemporary classical uh, works by Janacek and Stravinsky and Piazzolla and Martinu, and I did some arrangements... Uh, in uh, homage to Bernard Herrmann, who would have been celebrating his 100th birthday. He was the s- film score composer to many of Alfred Hitchcock's films. Yeah. So we did a, f- did a few uh, movements of Vertigo, uh, the soundtrack. And then the second CD was my arrangements, our arrangements of songs by Arcade Fire and Radiohead oh. and A Perfect Circle and uh, Bond John Redhead, John McLaughlin. Uh, so yeah, we're, we're, we've played a lot of different repertoire. In a way, yeah. we're looking back, but in another way, we're just going to the source. We're yeah. trying to get closer to the original voice yeah. that Beethoven would have known in his time. Mm-hmm. Um, I think you know one one example of the juxtaposition and the lesson of playing on these instruments. Um, you you listen to the Appassionata, the Opus Fifty Seven Sonata of Beethoven, and it, you know the Allegro begins with uh, just double-fisted bass chords, mm-hmm. and it just sounds so unwieldy on the on the modern piano. And if you play it on a forte piano, you all of a sudden have this sense of the transparency that you just can't get on the modern piano.
important. So it's very instructive. And in that way, it's really quite revolutionary. Again, getting going back to the original voice becomes more of a radical statement than uh, playing them, well, as we did in Eugene, Oregon, when there was no fortepiano or regular piano available. I played it on my Casio Privia, you know, perfectly happily. <laughs> um, the other nice, nice thing is is on, on the original instruments, uh, they resound much more uh, deeply and integrally. Uh, we tune our modern instruments to... Uh, a at 440 uh, mm. that's vibrations per second okay um, and uh, other modern orchestras sometimes tune as high as 442 444 46 to the a hmm. these instruments sound best at 430 we discovered that when wow. we arrived arrived in Chicago and the tuner had actually tuned uh, my forte piano to 440 and it sounded strangled and and really not very uh, happy mm-hmm. likewise Matt's gut strings you know didn't really sound that great at 4 440 and so when we got that straight you know at 430 everything just opened up and breathed and resounded and etc so playing playing them at the uh, at Sam uh, Sam Bond's garage in Eugene and not having any keyboard my Casio at the touch of a button can be tuned down to 430 so we were <laughs> so we were in absolute you know original tuning but playing on this digital piano That's and, you know, very go, cool. going back to your to your question I mean Chris and I reach out to uh, new audiences and and uh, young and old audiences um, but that's not how we choose our repertoire. I mean, we we, we follow our passions, and yeah. mm-hmm. with the with the with the first project with Shuffle Play Listen, um, we didn't play Arcade Fire and Radiohead uh, and John McLaughlin uh, because we were hoping that audience would come to us. We we, we played that music because we we just we love it just because as it's much awesome as Yana music. Czech and Stravinsky. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and we want it, it fit on our program, and yeah. and you know. The, the latest thing that's on our mind is this Beethoven on period instruments. And so we weren't thinking, oh, my God, this is really nerdy and, and nobody, you know, <laughs> we're going lo- to lose all of our Radiohead fans. Right. Um, right. We're, we were like, you know, this is what we got to do right now. And and hopefully, um, you know, the audience will will follow us as we, you know, experience this adventure. Well, it's a very yeah. cool sound. I mean, I, I've been I've been listening to the CD and it and it is. It is really neat. I mean, you can really hear the difference with the, the period instruments. And mm. But I have one more burning question before you guys um, take off. Mm. Did you wear period clothing <laughs> while recording this scene? Just wigs. The, pu- the puffy wigs. shirt. <laughs> the, puffy, the Seinfeld puffy shirt. Yes. No, I guess I guess we didn't. We didn't. Oh, that's too bad. Chris, Chris took his shoes off. Does that count? Is yes, that I did take yeah. my shoes yes, off. Yeah. That does count. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, because I've, we've got our well here's the other anachronism you know we were both playing off of iPads really? um, and I had my I had my uh, foot switch to turn the pages yeah. and then I had these very odd uh, pedals the soft pedal that we were in love with and the other pedal the actually the the damper pedal you know the one that makes things sort of wet and echoey on the piano mm-hmm. that was actually split in two I could actually play with pedal on the upper end of the piano and not at the uh, the bottom if I so chose so yeah I really needed to have toe contact with these pedals to really just be able to tell them apart but he wouldn't let me take my shoes off so I I kept kept mine on he he should really change his socks more often (laughs) 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 we've been on tour far too long Well, on that note, I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up. I really appreciate you guys coming on the show today. And and actually, this has been great because uh, we have been wanting to get both of you individually onto the show for for ages. And now we got you both. This was this well, was, was fabulous. A great opportunity and a really kill two players time. with one. With That's right. One don't kill the pi- don't shoot the piano player. I hope you come back with. Um, yeah, this was great. Either fun. together or separately. Either way is great. Um, yes, anytime. Thanks, thanks guys. All right, everybody, that about does it for this episode of Classical Classroom. For more Classical Classroom, just go to houstonpublicmedia.org backslash classroom or check out an exhaustive list or exhausting list, whichever way you want to look at it, of our shows at soundcloud.com backslash classical classroom. Uh, You can follow us on Twitter and Tumblr 
or you can email me at dclay at houstonpublicmedia.org. Did you know that you can also listen to us on Stitcher and TuneIn, apps for your mobile devices? True story. Thanks today to audio producer Todd, Todd Rundgren Holslander for twiddling knobs. Thanks to program director Sinjin Flynn for his highly questionable taste in pop music. Thanks to Mark DeClaudio for his piercing gray eyes. Thanks to Christopher O'Reilly and Matt Heimovitz for being on the show. Thanks to me for saying words. But of course, most of all, thanks to you for listening. We'll catch you next time.